I love you. Thank you for joining us once again on Zoom. It is the greatest invention because even in spite of COVID and people having problems flying in, we can have interviews that honor the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like today, we have a special guest, Dr. Kekel. Uh, he has written numerous books about prayer, which is really the most important part of our Christian walk, praying in Jesus' name. And we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, he has sponsored local uh, Houston, Texas churches uh, over the last 28 years. Uh, he is a prolific writer. He has graduated sum cum laude from uh, universities, like graduated from the Sam Houston State University. Uh, he also earned his master's degree at Perkins School of Theology uh, at Southern Methodist University, on and on, because I can keep going, and we'll take away from the interview today. But I am so thrilled, so glad, because this is our second time together on this same book. We were talking before, and I said, you know what? We only covered a very little of that book. It is a wonderful book. Let me, this is an opportunity for you to go to, uh, your opportunity will be on the screen often, that you can go to the areas that you can order the book, because this is a keepsake. Once you have this, you know, most books, sometimes you read them and you give them away. I don't think this will happen, because it's amazing uh, kind of book that you can use as a re reference. But let me welcome today, Dr. Terry Kakel. Good to have you again. Hi. I'm most delighted to be here. I kind of a privilege to be here the second time, because I know that doesn't happen very often. So I, I just thank God for that. Well, you know, you know uh, it's, it's, it's amazing when I, when I read these books, I, and it's got to be the Holy Spirit. When I'm reading them, there's something that either comes off the page and I kind of lean back in my chair and go, wow. Or I just start reading and go, okay, it's a lot of good information. People need to know it. But sometimes like this, I have to pause when I'm reading and let it kind of sink in almost like a sponge. And you have, right. you have that phenomenal ability. You are a seminar speaker all over the country, right? And world. Right. I get ready to go do one right now in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and now how do you begin these seminars? What is your opening salvo? Uh, that we are desperate for God and we don't realize it. And if we pray that desperation is met and God comes to us and helps us uh, we can do very little on our own, but we need his help, especially in ministry. And so I just tell them, today's our day to revive and renew our dependence upon him. Because if he doesn't come through, nothing's going to happen. You've been in the ministry how many years? 55 years. God bless you. Then 1,200 seminars. Uh, I'm more excited today. Than I was when I did my first seminar. I know that feeling. I really so do. Know you that. know that yourself. Yeah. When you sit that. in that chair, the yeah. excitement comes. Yeah. Uh, I want to go, you, you call your chapters chronicles. Right. Instead of chapters. But I want to start on, on this second go around. And uh, what an honor to have you the second time. A theology of prayer. That's on uh, Chronicle 13. Right. If we could move into that and capsulize what you meant there. Well, you know, everything uh, has an operating system. Your computer has an operating system called Microsoft. And when it comes to prayer, we need an operating system that motivates us to pray, biblically undergirds us to pray, and is the uh, divine reasoning why we pray 
And when I went to seminary, sometimes I call it cemetery, but I shouldn't. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's been called that often. So uh, I was I was never taught to pray. I never was uh, given anything on prayer. And when I wrote my credo, which is my what I have learned in four years of seminary, I didn't even mention prayer. And the professor didn't even notice it. So I, I, um, I found myself one time starting a new church with only eight people. I was desperate. And it drove me to a, a new level of prayer in this desperation. I only had eight people coming to this new church and owed a lot of money. So I was just cast to prayer, laid on my face in a, a cabin, <clears throat> cabin in the woods. And he said, build this church in prayer. And so that's been my passion every day for 55 years. Uh, but what can we do to pray better, pray longer and more effectively? And of course, the, the, the essence of that is the name of Jesus. Uh, that when we pray in his, he told us, he said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll grant you. And so I just wanted to write a book that would bring his name to the front of the line, put a bigger spotlight on it, make it preeminent so that that name will become more and more important in prayer ministries. Because as you know, and I know, you could sometimes go to a funeral or church and never hear his name. Exactly. We, we have so many other names, name Bishop so-and-so, and, -so and, and, and but it's about him. It's not about them. It's about uh, uh, his name being glorified uh, because he said, you shall produce fruit and that fruit shall be lasting fruit. So whatever you ask in my name, I did that for almost 40 years, I taught seminars on prayer, wrote 18 books on prayer, taught about the name of Jesus. But in these days, I find that name receding instead of becoming more prominent. So I wanted to write a book to bring it back to the forefront that, uh, that would show over 21 centuries. The only thing the church had was the name of Jesus. Uh, early, they didn't have organization. They didn't have credit cards. They didn't have weekly meetings. They didn't have a Bible to hold because the Bible wasn't printed yet. All they had was the name of Jesus. Uh, many people couldn't read or write. And so these early uh, missionaries just walked around talking about Jesus. And when they did, uh, miracles happened. People were raised from the dead. Uh, the book of Acts never quit. Uh, Acts is still being written. I call it Acts 29 because there's only 28 chapters. But you're writing chapter 29 right there in Florida. Commensurate with the other 28. And so I just showed back through history how all of them uh, spoke his name. And whenever there was a, a kind of a decline in his name, there was a decline in the church. Uh, but realizing the power of that name, you know, in the in AD 400, there were 30 million Christians in the world. Uh, and they had no buildings. I said they had no Bible. They were up against great odds. They had no roads, uh, tremendous handicaps. And yet they were revolutionizing the world because they would just simply go into a pagan place, demonstrate Jesus in his name, call on his name. The pagans would see the outstanding miracles that he would do. Uh, for example, there was a man named Gregory the Wonder Worker. He went to a town in Pontius, Turkey, which was the equivalent of Las Vegas back in those days. When he went there, there was only 17 Christians. When he left, there were only 17 pagans. <laughs> wow. He evangelized the whole town without, uh, without rapid communication, without the modern things that we have to communicate with. He just spoke Jesus. See, when you speak Jesus, he comes alive because he is alive. And that name is his portal to enter into the hospital room or the jail cell or your cancer treatment. When you speak his name, that name makes him uh, fully alive, the resurrected Lord. And he just does his thing as he always has. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God. 
I read where John Wesley got up at 4 a.m. And for the first four hours of his day, he prayed. Right. And that was the secret of that uh, movement, uh, which his prayer life was contagious and caught on by all his class leaders and his lay preachers and whatnot. Whitfield caught uh, it. Yeah. I got to go to his room uh, in, in London at uh, Wesley Chapel and in his office, his bedroom, there's a little kneeler where he prayed four hours a day. And right to the side is a little heater, a wood burning heater. But I asked the tour guide, could I kneel on that kneeler? And I did. And suddenly I realized that was the birthplace wow. of this movement. And I asked that that mantle, that anointing would come on me so I could be also like that for my generation. Because uh, I see churches doing all kind of mechanical things, uh, bringing in all kind of consultants, uh, doing whatever the other church is doing to grow, copycats of all kinds of things. And yet the answer is not in that. The answer is in the revelation of Jesus and his name and his power. And if we'll call on that name, uh, the demons will leave and miracles will happen. I remember, uh, did I tell this story last time? Uh, a man called me to go see a student in the in a university where I pastored. He had cancer. He only had uh, three days to live. He was a Buddhist, Richard Hahn. And I went in his room. He, sure enough, he was near death. And, and I didn't know what to pray, Herman. I just stood there by his bed and said, Jesus. I would say, Jesus. Just pausing and say, Jesus. That's all I said. And I left the room. Next day, I called and I asked the nurse's station. I said, How's Richard doing? He said, He went home. I said, Which funeral home? <laughs> she said, No, no. He got up, got dressed, and went back to the dorm. I called him. He's a Buddhist. He didn't know anything about Christianity. And I said, Richard, what happened? He said, Well, I kind of vaguely remember you. But when you left, a man in a white robe and a beard appeared in my room, didn't say a word, touched my bed, and the cancer left. Jesus physically appeared in that room because he comes in answer to his name. Well, that if all you do, if that all you do is every time, right? Huh? That won't happen every time. That was exclusive. That was yeah, God got my attention in that. In fact, as I asked God, why didn't you appear while I was there? Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, you would have written a book about it. <laughs> it would have set you back 10, 10, 10 years because you'd always expect me to show up. But that was a revelation to me. You, you know, sometimes we put God in boxes yeah. and theologies yeah. and we try to contain the uncontainable. We try to define the undefinable. And he does things sometimes to get our attention. And that day he got my attention. I'm reminded of you flying to New York, I think it was for, for an engagement where you were going to speak at a large church in, I think it was Albany, I'm, I'm going by memory. And you were seated, seated next to a, a man. When you talked to him, he said, and you told him where you're going and the church, he said, I used to go there. My, my, my family, we all went there. And in fact, he said he was on the board or something. And his wife got cancer. And they had a whole church of prayers and constantly for his wife. And she died. And he said, I haven't gone back to church since. Do you remember that story in the book? I remember that story, yeah. And, and, and I thought to myself, isn't that amazing? He, saw everybody praying and his mind was that many people praying my wife has got to be healed but but you you have you have the the greatest statements when you say uh, the uh jesus told us to pray like this our father he repeats uh he refers to god as father over 100 times so is it the way we pray? Is it the 
the method we use, what brings the power of healing and what allows the person to leave this earth and go to the better place anyway. What I found in the early Christians where they weren't distracted by television, sports, buying stuff, reading stuff because they couldn't read. All they had was the name. And when they prayed for hours every day, some of the monks prayed nine hours a day. That lifestyle so filled their tank that when they spoke that name, it had exponential results because uh, they were full of the name. Sometimes we get so distracted uh, by things. I, I'm not saying that we, when we speak his name, sometimes we're shallow in doing it, but it does help to spend time with him, yeah. to worship him, yeah. to have a relationship with him, that when you come out of that and you speak his name, it's like a nuclear bomb going off, as opposed to watching television 10 hours a day and doing something else another day. And then suddenly something happens and you say, in Jesus' name, it's kind of like a fire extinguisher. You grab it right quick. Well, it's not that. It's a lifestyle of a relationship with him. And that out of that, that fullness of relationship, we speak that name, demons shudder, things happen. And I, and I just have seen that so many times. Communities taken for Christ in Jesus' name. Pastors walking streets, driving around, saying in Jesus' name. And that fullness, that effectiveness, that efficaciousness of that name sometimes comes out of a lifestyle that is committed to him. And not just a casual, another name. I, I, I wrote this down from that story that I just told. And, and you say prayer th thrives. This is in the book. Prayer th thrives when it is Christ-centered, not crisis-motivated. Right. So, so yeah, the, 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 that's where we find ourselves so often in a crisis. And like you just alluded to, we pray and we may have not prayed for the last two weeks. You know, what we do is seek his hand, not his face. Uh, when we seek his face, we get his essence and who he is. And I wrote another book called The Presence-Based Church, which contrasted with the consumer-based church. Herman, most of our churches are, are consumer-based. They see people coming in the building as customers, and they want to give them the deal. It's a business. And make it comfortable and make it where they'll come back. And they don't care where, where they come from. They may steal them from another church. But we're in a consumer age. And that has, has killed the prayer life because we've made it a list seeking his hand, not his face. Wow. Because prayer is about the heart, not just the hand. He may, he may help your team win. He may help you find your keys. He may do this or that. But that's not the point. The point is, our, our relationship with him, of intimacy, being stunned by his beauty, being arrested by his uh, magnanimousness, just being captured by the essence of Jesus, where we are just overwhelmed with his greatness. And, and that just grows in us, that we have a passion for his presence. Do you have, people, do you have people that look at you and think that you're the source of that power when you pray for them rather than the one you're praying about? No, I explain it this way. I'm just a PVC pipe. I got one hand to God and one hand to them and God flows through me. I have nothing to do with it. So I tell people, I said, well, you're a good looking piece of wire because that's all you are. <laughs> yeah, you're a conduit for yeah. God's grace. And when you speak his name, he flows through you to them. Uh, I was, Chronicles 15, you talk about Christians who prayed and changed the course of history. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, they did. Uh, when you look at what uh, happened in, in Wales with Evan Roberts, that revival that helped in there where, where he would go to churches and say, this is the prayer. This is the only prayer we're going to pray for the next eight hours. Come, Lord Jesus, and send your Holy Spirit over and over and over till four o'clock in the morning. And Jesus came in such a powerful way. The whole nation was converted. 
people would come there and it was like a contagion that went like COVID everywhere. Revival happened because of that. He changed that. John Wesley, England was on the verge of a, a revolution like they had in France. And John Wesley, one man, changed that nation because he was a conduit of God's grace and power. So I just see examples of that all through history of men and women who prayed and changed their country, changed their nation. Uh, and it's just, it, it left me, I am so impressed. If I could do it again, I'd be even more impressed with his name to impress that on people that you just worship him. Just say Jesus and pause and say Jesus. And he comes and when he gives you a revelation of him, you're caught up into him and it's you'll never get over it. Um, so it's been amazing to see that, like Gregory the Wonder Worker, change that whole town. Uh, example after example, men and women who had nothing, no bank account, no credit cards, no communication, no Bible. Yet they would take 60,000 square miles. Uh, Martin of Tours took 200,000 square, 200, square miles for Christ, just walking around saying, Jesus. Maybe I say someday, sometimes today we have too much and we trust in too much other than trusting in his name and, and to try to recover that dependence on his name, uh, that codependence on his name, that if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be. And if it wasn't for him, we couldn't do anything. So I know sometimes there are unanswered prayers and I don't have the answer to that, Herman, just like you don't. But all I know is I've been ordered to pray in his name and leave the results to him. And I don't know all the variables and situations and why some do get healed and some don't. I don't know. All I know is I'm to speak his name, to believe and have faith and leave the results to him because we're not uh, the results. He, he is. Yeah. We, we don't produce anything. He does. You know, I'm reminded. Don't make it happen. He makes it happen. I'm reminded in the book of luke 11th chapter uh verses five to six where this man went to his friend's house because he had company yeah. and he had no food and he went to his friend thinking he said i i, I need three three uh, loaves of bread my, my friend has come i have nothing to prepare for him will you please help me he said i'm in bed with my kids and the door is locked go away the guy didn't give up he stayed there because he was not going to go back empty handed. And the word of God talks about how that's how persistent it's yeah. like Matthew seven, seven, knock, 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 how persistent we must yeah. be, but we give up all the time. Yeah. We pray, we pray uh, 10 seconds, no results. We say, Oh, I guess it wasn't God's will. Well, how do we know? We didn't pray the price. Yeah. We 10 seconds. Then we go watch a football game for three hours. Yes. It, we got our priorities all messed up. Absolutely. And it's interesting in that passage, his persistence, you know what it was called? It was called shameless audacity. Wow. Shameless because we're not, we, we've been healed of our sin. We're not longer shameful. We are being graced. So we pray with shameless audacity. And the audacity is that we ask God for things that are far beyond anything that we could imagine. Uh, I tell people in one chapter, if you saw his biceps, you would pray bigger prayers. Just to compliment his greatness. Wow. Uh, and, and he likes that. He likes us to say, Lord, give me the high school in Jesus' name. And he says, wow, he thinks I'm that great. I'll give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> It's, all, it's, it's interesting that the guy asked for three loaves of bread. And interesting, because I, I, I love numbers. But when you read the detail of scripture, he's there in detail. And just like you say, in Jesus' name, that introduces power. Will not God vindicate his elect to cry out to him day and night? And that is the essence of uh, crying out to him, waiting upon him. Chronicles 17 in your book, learning how to pray over 21 centuries. Mm -hmm. 
that's been the uh, the secret 21 centuries for uh, Reese Howells, A.B. Simpson, Bill Bright, all of them, that they were so enamored with that name, so captured by it, especially Bill Bright. I have a whole section in the book about that man, what he did. Uh, I had his cl close friend write, write that section because I wanted the right, correct details. And uh, the man so much believed in prayer. Uh, he had a chapel set aside where people would pray eight hours a day. Uh, they raised their own support. And their support was not to go out to camp campuses, but was to stay in that room and pray all day long. And he had rooms like that everywhere. And that was the power plant. That was the source. He was just a, a businessman, but mightily used of God because he was sold out. Doctor, will you man. pray for us? We got about we got about less than two minutes. Well, Father, I just thank pray you right now that you would restore the name to the church. We have so many other names. We have consultants and other people, but Lord, we want you. We want your name to be glorified. We want you to be mentioned in every sermon. Yes. We want you to be mentioned in every pastoral newsletter. We want your name to be famous. And we want that name to capture people. Yes. We want people to say, you know, all he said was Jesus, and I can't get it out of my mind. And then call upon him and be saved. So powerful is that name. And Lord, we just, we're right here on this TV program. We're only scratching the surface yes. of the depth, the height, the length, and the weight of your name. Yes. Let that weight come upon us. That as we wait upon you, you will weigh us down with uh, supremacy and the essence of that name. That when we speak that name, we ourselves are overwhelmed. Bless this TV ministry Amen. that the years ahead will be far greater than the years in the past. Lord, we're not looking in a rearview mirror. We're looking out a big windshield yes. for this TV program Amen. just to be expanded to other nations, other languages, because Herman hasn't seen the, the, the best yet yes. is to come. And we thank you for that, Father. Bless him, his program, his staff workers, everyone there, equipment, keep them safe because they're doing the kingdom's work in Jesus' name. Amen. Get your copy. The information is there. God bless you. Bye-bye.